Uh, this first picture is going to be uh, the histology of coccidioides. So this is one of the, uh, the fungi, uh, the systemic mycoses that you need to know for the USMLE and COMLEX. So a few things about coccidioides. Here we see endospores uh, within a spherule. Uh, endospores within a spherule. And the important thing to know about this is that these are much, much larger than red, red blood cells. So if you see this on histology or a smear or something like that, and you see a red blood cell next to it, you get to see the size of it, then you're starting to think about coccidioides. Uh, a few other things about coccidioides, it can be diagnosed with a silver stain, uh, one of the few. And also with these systemic mycoses, one of the important things that they usually give you in the question stem is the location, uh, the demographics to kind of help narrow it down. So the important one for coccidioides is going to be the southwestern United States. So if in the vignette they're talking about California, New Mexico, Arizona, that kind of place, uh, you want to start thinking about coccidioides. It can be inhaled from dust. So uh, I believe in the sketchy micro video they mentioned that there was an earthquake that caused a lot of dust to be flung up in the air and a lot of people in the southwestern United States uh, actually got coccidioides. And then the final thing that I want to mention about coccidioides is that it can cause meningitis. So I know when people hear meningitis, they usually jump to uh, Neisseria or other bacteria or even viruses. But it, it, it is also important to note that uh, certain fungi can cause meningitis as well, and coccidioides is one of them. The next image is going to be a schwannoma. We will see it right here. So a few important things about this. A schwannoma is also called an acoustic neuroma. Uh, it's usually unilateral, and the most common area for it to occur is the cerebellopontine angle. So you see that area right here. This is obviously the cerebellum. Here is the pons, and this angle right here is that cerebellopontine angle, and obviously you see the schwannoma lodged right in here. Uh, these are usually unilateral, and when they are, uh, they tend to cause unilateral hearing loss. Um, but if they are bilateral, that's highly suspicious of neurofibromatosis type 2. So if for some reason you um, see in a vignette that a person has bilateral schwannomas and then a relative comes in, you definitely want to be thinking about neurofibromatosis type 2. Uh, one other important thing about schwannomas that a lot of people don't know about is that they are S100 positive. Uh, S100 is a cell marker for uh, cells of neural crest origin. So it's important to know that. There's also another important disease that is also S100 positive. Do you know what that is? That's going to be a melanoma. So super important to know that I have seen it in questions. If you see S100 positive, the two things that you want to jump up to the top of your differential are schwannoma, also called an, an acoustic neuroma, and melanoma. So, so those are the two things. This next one is going to be an example of a white blood cell cast. So a couple important things with this. It's usually seen in tubulo interstitial inflammation, so inflammation of the uh, the tubules and the kidneys, as well as the interstitial area. It's also seen in acute pyelonephritis and in transplant rejection. So uh, they'll usually give you some type of vignette that has something to do with renal pathology, and they'll give you a picture of this, and they might ask you what it is, or they might ask you to make the diagnosis. So the three main times when you'll see this, one more time, tubulo interstitial inflammation, acute pyelonephritis, and transplant rejection. Those are the three times where you'll see a white blood cell cast. Uh, this next one is an example of lipofusin. You can see the arrow here, but it's obviously throughout the entire uh, image. So this is lipofusin seen in hepatocytes in the liver cells. So it's really important to know a couple things about lipofusin. Uh, what is it? First of all, it's a brown pigment that is a byproduct of turnover of peroxidized lipids. It is important to know that. I have seen questions on it. Lipofusin is a byproduct of turnover of peroxidized lipids. Super important to know that. And the other important thing is that it's seen with normal aging. So this, there's no type of pathology associated here. This is something that you'll get as you age. It, it um, deposits in the heart, in the liver, and a couple other structures as well. And an important thing to realize is that if you see this, don't necessarily jump to a condition like hem uh, hemochromatosis. I know it can be tempting because you're thinking iron, brown, and it's in the liver, but really look back at the vignette and the information that they're giving you. If it's a patient that has that kind of bronze diabetes, you know, uh, high transferrin level, that kind of thing, then you want to be thinking hemochromatosis. 
But otherwise, if it's a normal patient, you want to be thinking lipofusin. And the other important thing to differentiate between the two is that hemochromatosis, the iron is usually stained with something else. Do you remember what that is? That's going to be Prussian blue, a Prussian blue stain. And I know I've had a picture of that in a, in a previous video. So a Prussian blue stain for uh, iron and hemochromatosis. This next one is an example of Candida albicans. Uh, there is a ton that I can say about this, but I'll just keep it short. So in this picture here, we are seeing the pseudohyphae as well as the budding yeasts. And it's important to know that because this is occurring at 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, normal, the thing for uh, fungi is uh, mold in the cold, yeast in the heat. That's kind of flip-flopped for Candida albicans. In this case, this is at 20 degrees Celsius. You're seeing a yeast in the cold. And then what do you see at uh, 37 degrees Celsius? Germ tubes. You're going to see germ tubes for Candida albicans at 37 degrees Celsius. One other important thing that I do want to note about Candida albicans, obviously there's a ton of different things, but one thing that I've seen uh, several times is that it is catalase positive. Super important to know that. Um, they'll throw it in vignettes and a lot of people will automatically jump to bacteria and to staphylococcus. But it is also important to realize that Candida albicans is also catalase positive. So if you see that, you still need to keep that in mind for your differential. This next image is a CT scan of the brain, and this is an example of multiple sclerosis. So what you're seeing here is these periventricular plaques. You're seeing these um, areas of white around the uh, ventricles here. So periventricular plaques. Uh, this is actually a brain MRI, excuse me, I said CT scan, this is a brain MRI. And you're seeing, uh, if you see this, you want to be thinking multiple sclerosis. Uh, there's really nothing else that I can think of that looks like this. So if you see this scan, uh, it's almost a dead giveaway for multiple sclerosis. This next one I have shown an image of before, but it was in a different form. Uh, but I told you that it's extremely recognizable, so it's almost a dead giveaway. This is glioblastoma. If you see this, immediately think glioblastoma. It literally looks like a part of the, the brain was kind of just blown out completely. You're going to see some, uh, some serious midline shift here. So if somebody just like, the way this seems to me is somebody took a melon baller uh, and they just kind of scooped out a big part of the brain. And if you see that, you automatically want to be thinking glioblastoma. This next one is an example of calcium oxalate crystals. So these are obviously uh, in kidney stones. These are the most common type of kidney stone. Uh, about 80% of cases are calcium oxalate crystals. Uh, a couple of things to note about this is that the treatment is uh, citrate. The reason being that citrate can chelate calcium and, and help to bind it in the urine um, so that it doesn't form these stones. And another important thing to note is that patients who have this type of nephrolithiasis are normocalcemic and hypercalciuric. Very important to know that. So let me say it again. Patients are normocalcemic. They have a normal level of calcium in the blood, but they are hypercalciuric. They have increased calcium in the urine. And that should make sense because that's what will cause the saturation and the formation of these calcium oxalate crystals. Um, in several different textbooks. They're described as envelope shaped or even sometimes dumbbell shaped. Uh, I mean, it doesn't really look like that to me, but I guess so. So envelope shaped or dumbbell shaped, you want to be thinking calcium oxalate crystals. Uh, this next one is an interesting one. This is an example of a dandy walker malformation. So what happens here is you have the absence of the cerebellum, which you see back here. There's no cerebellum where you would normally find it. And that causes a massive dilation of the fourth ventricle. So this whole black space that we're seeing back here is actually the fourth ventricle. And uh, it's also associated with hydrocephalus. So obviously, if you have a massive ventricle, it's going to be completely filled with CSF. And it's going to be overloaded. And that's going to cause uh, hydrocephalus. So this is Dandy Walker malformation. This next one that we see uh, circled down here is an example of a Peyer's patch. So a few things to note about Peyer's patches. They are uh, unencapsulated lymphoid tissue in the lamina propria and submucosa of the ilium. Very important to know all of those words. It's found in the lamina propria and submucosa of the ilium. So super important to know that. A couple other things to note is that Peyer's patches contain M cells, which are 
basically the antigen presenting cells uh, of the of the gut of the GI system and that also the B cells in the germinal center of these pyres patches can produce secretory IgA. So it's important to know that IgA is kind of the main antibody of the uh, of the gut of the entire GI system and one of the places that they are produced is here by the B cells in the pyres patches. Um, this next one is pretty tough. It's an example of necrolytic migratory erythema. So uh, you probably won't see a picture of this on the exam, and if you do, it, it has to be given with a, a really good vignette. So necrolytic migratory erythema is obviously these skin lesions typically seen around the mouth and the distal extremities. So you see, you see both of those here. And the important thing to note is that it is associated with a glucagonoma. So I can almost guarantee that you won't just see this picture on the exam and then they'll ask you to diagnose it. They'll give you some type of vignette that's leading you towards glucagonoma, or they might even outright say glucagonoma, and they'll ask you perhaps, <coughs> excuse me, perhaps what the, um, what the physical finding might be, and, and it's going to be necrolytic migratory erythema. It's a really hard one to diagnose, maybe a little lower yield, but if you do see it, it's almost a dead giveaway. This next one is an example of pig bodies. So these are protein aggregates that we see uh, in neurons that are caused by hyperphosphorylation of tau protein. Super important to know that. Pick bodies are caused by hyperphosphorylation of tau protein. Uh, now, in another video, if you guys have watched all my videos, I talked about Lewy bodies, which can sometimes look a little similar to this, so you might get tripped up by that. But it's important to, to make a distinction. So rack your minds and try and figure out what Lewy bodies are composed of. If you remember, what is it? It's alpha synuclein. So I'll say that one more time. Lewy bodies are composed of alpha synuclein. Pick bodies are composed of hyperphosphorylated tau protein. Really important to know that distinction because they can look kind of similar. And obviously, pick bodies are seen in pick disease. This next one is an example of a Maltese cross. You see a couple of them here. This is a really good one. It looks kind of like a chromosome in my opinion. Uh, so what is a Maltese cross? It is a tetrad of trophozoites uh, seen in red blood cells. So you see one here as well and probably the formation of one up here. So these are a tetrad of trophozoites seen in red blood cells and the big condition associated with this is babesiosis. Uh, a couple things to note about babesiosis. Probably the main thing is that it is transmitted by what? Do you guys remember? It's transmitted by the ixodes tick. And why is that important? Because there's another disease that's also transmitted by the ixodes tick. And what is that? That's going to be uh, Lyme disease. Lyme disease caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. So just to recap here, Maltese cross are tetrads of trophozoites seen in red blood cells. The condition they're associated with is babesiosis, which is transmitted by the ixodes tick. Another condition transmitted by the ixodes tick is Lyme disease. So there's a lot of microbiology there, um, but it's really important to know all of those little buzzwords because they'll probably give you one of those uh, to help you come to the diagnosis. This next one is where the USMLE and the COMLEX want you to use a little bit of geometry. So this is an example of the mucor fungus. And the main thing that you want to be looking at is right here. You're going to see it over here as well, maybe a little bit over here. These are the right angle branching non-septate hyphae. Let me say that again. Right angle branching non-septate hyphae. If you see something like that, if you see this 90 degree bran uh, branching here, there are three uh, type of fungi that you want to be thinking about. Uh, the first one is absidia. The second one is rhizopus, and the third one is mucor. And the way I remember that is that they spell arm or ram, whichever you prefer. So again, you see this right angle branching, you're thinking absidia, rhizopus, or mucor. And one of the conditions associated with this is mucor mycosis. And one of the big physical findings that you see with muc mucor mycosis is a black eschar in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. If you see that, if they give you that in a vignette, you almost immediately jump to mucor mycosis, or if they give you this, you want to be thinking about mucor and mucor mycosis as well. This is an example of a chronic pyelonephritis, 
And what's happening here is um, that the giveaway is the, that this is a thyroidization of the kidney. So what that means is there's been a uh, recurring and chronic kidney infection, and that causes a buildup within the uh, tubular interstitial cells. So it looks kind of like the thyroid. Here's the, the histology of the thyroid uh, to kind of help you out. So this is a thyroidization of uh, the kidney seen in chronic pyelonephritis. So really quick, just to pan back one more time. If you see this, you want to be thinking chronic pyelonephritis. What's another thing that we talked about a little earlier in the video also associated with pyelonephritis? That's going to be white blood cell casts. So chronic pyelonephritis, you're going to see these thyroidization of the kidneys here, and you're also going to see some white blood cell casts. This next one, uh, I have seen a couple times on a few different exams. Uh, this is an example of lamellar bodies. And what these lamellar bodies are, this is seen on electron microscopy. These uh, store surfactant and transport it to the cell surface in type 2 pneumocytes. So this whole thing is a big type 2 pneumocyte. These are the, one, these are the uh, pneumocytes that produce surfactant. And these lamellar bodies that you see pretty much throughout the entire cell are what store the surfactant. Now, really important to, uh, to read the question here. I know when a lot of people see this, and I know when I first saw it, I immediately jumped to mitochondria. This looks kind of like a mitochondria but they'll probably give you some type of information talking about uh, the respiratory system or surfactant or, or something like that. So you want to be thinking lamellar body. So it's a pretty uncommon thing to know. Uh, not a lot of people do know it, so that's why I'm showing it here. Production of surfactant stored in lamellar bodies in type 2 pneumocytes. This next one is an example of Virchow's node, and you see it right here. So Virchow's node is a left supraclavicular, right above the clavicle, lymph node um, that can be a sign of metastasis of cancer from the stomach. It's, uh, it's a pretty random finding, but I've seen questions on this as well. So if they tell you about some type of mass right above the clavicle on the left, patient has um, fatigue, weight loss, that kind of stuff, you want to be thinking about a Virchow's node, and you want to be thinking about metastasis of cancer from the stomach. This node here, this lymph node, will be hard and enlarged if that is the case. This next one is an example of cytomegalovirus. Um, there's so much that I can talk about with cytomegalovirus, so I'll keep it super simple for now and, and maybe make a video in the future. So really what we're looking at here are these owl eye nuclei uh, within the cell. These are intranuclear inclusion bodies, and when you see this, um, you want to start thinking about cytomegalovirus. Again, so many things that I can talk about with CMV. I won't even get into it right now for time's sake. This next one is an example of osteosarcoma. And what the arrow is pointing to here is called Codman Triangle. And what Codman Triangle is, is it's an elevation of the periosteum off of the bone. So you kind of see the periosteum here being elevated off of the primary part of the bone. And when you see that, it's a sign of osteosarcoma, usually occurring in children. Uh, in a previous video, I talked about another x-ray finding associated with osteosarcoma. Do you remember what that is? That's going to be the sunburst pattern. So if you see a Codman's triangle or if you see a sunburst pattern, you definitely want to be thinking about osteosarcoma. And this is going to be the last image. Uh, this is an example of the dermatomes of the body. And you're not going to see a picture like this on the exam, but I really thought that it was important to, to go through this regardless because uh, they do like to ask a lot of sensory and innervation kind of questions on the exam, especially in the arm and the hand. So just to cover a couple of things real quick, um, obviously you want to know the breakdown of the dermatomes of the hand when they start talking about paresthesias, down in the fingers, that kind of thing. You want to know the nerve roots attributed to that. Uh, just as a reference point, T4 is the nipple line. Um, they usually don't ask about these because they correspond well with the ribs. Um, it's also important to know the ones in the leg, L1 through L5. These are a little bit difficult to remember because they're kind of uh, random down the leg. Lower yield than the arm. The arm is definitely the higher yield part. And then the last thing to know is going to be uh, the innervation of the genitals, which is usually S2 to S4, and you see that on the front and the back in the anus as well, innervation uh, and dermatomes are going to be S2 to S4.